Collections are structures that all have one same fundamental purpose, to help us organize data effectively within a program. We first started the course working with primitive data, just regular stuff like ints and booleans and characters, and then we worked our way toward defining our own complex reference types and then using them to do stuff. Uh, and then we took those reference types and also, also uh, primitive data, and we organized them into arrays so that we could do things in batches, so that we could ma manipulate large quantities of data all at once. So in fact, we've been using collections the entire time. A collection is just a group of things that we want to treat as one conceptual unit. And basically, anything you'd ever want to do probably uses collections in some way. So an example of this is strings and arrays. Those are collections of characters and, you know, some arbitrary type of element. In this unit, we're going to talk about a bunch of other types, uh, lists and stacks and queues and sets and maps. And there's also trees and graphs. And you'll treat these collections, these data structures, in greater detail in future classes. Uh, but uh, we'll at least but we'll at least introduce you to the ideas here. We'll mostly focus on lists as the, the main data structure that we're gonna work with. And when you're working with these collections, you know, they can either be homogeneous, which means they, they have data all of one particular type, or they can be heterogeneous, which means they have data of different types. So if you'd like, take a second and just pause this, read through this little chart of some different types of collections, some different data structures that you might use. Again, you'll treat most of these in greater detail in the future. Now, if you'll recall from working with arrays, one of our great frustrations is that arrays are statically sized, which means we decide initially how big they're going to be, and then they're stuck at that size forever. Collections are typically dynamic rather than static, which means they can grow or they can shrink with whatever our problem demands. Now, in general, when you have a collection, there are a couple key things you're going to want to be able to do, and the collections work in different ways so doing these things will look different for different collections, for different data structures. But in general, you want to be able to search and retrieve for something. You want to be able to remove something from the collection. You want to be able to insert something, maybe at an arbitrary position. You'd like to be able to swap something in out, so to replace an item, uh, or maybe traverse the entire data structure itself. And you probably also want to be able to figure out what the size of the collection is, how much stuff is currently in it. Now, these are all things we've been doing with arrays for a while now. So maybe you're wondering, well, why define these other types of collections? Why not just use arrays to do whatever we need to do? And in fact, people who were writing in early programming languages, that's what they did. They just used arrays. Uh, but as we've seen, for instance, with strings, you could conceive of a string as really an array or a collection of characters. Well, sometimes there are things that we want to be able to do with strings. For instance, take a string and send it to lowercase. That's a, a string-specific thing that we'd like to be able to do. So in general, we like to be able to develop more specialized, easier to use data structures that we can use in place of arrays. Now that doesn't mean arrays are always a bad choice and sometimes they'll be the right choice, but uh, we, want it, we want to introduce other options for, for us to organize our data. Now there are a bunch of default classes that come defined in the package java.util and they're all related to collections. And you can sort of divide them into two categories. On the one hand, you have interfaces, which are defining what particular types of collections can actually do. You know, what methods are they going to they're actually going to have to have defined. We also have classes, which then implement those interfaces. It makes sense to do it this way. If you think an interface sort of tells us the general behaviors of a class of objects, think back to pen or or shape. Whereas then you have a specific class like a rainbow pen or a circle that actually implements those behaviors. The interfaces and the classes in the collections packages that we're going to use in java.util, they have that same relationship. The interfaces are going to tell us what these, what these collections can do, and the classes actually do them. An example that we'll see shortly is that uh, there's a list interface that tells us, well, if I have a list of things, here are the things I want to be able to do. And we'll have two classes, array list and linked list, that both implement that list interface. So then what you can do is you can write a program that generally uses list methods. So those are interface methods. But you can decide whether you want to actually use an array list or a linked list based on the specific constraints of the problem, based on specific, say, runtime or space concerns. That's, that's a key advantage of, of writing with an interface in mind rather than just one specific class. These are the interfaces that we'll talk about. It's worth noting that set and list both extend the collection interface here. So that means that the set and list classes have to implement methods like size and is empty 
that are that are included in the collection interface. There are other methods that are specific just to lists, so they're included in the list interface rather than in collection. I'm thinking in particular of an index-based remove. If you go back to the other slide and, and, and review, sets are, are so these unordered collections of unique items. So it doesn't really make sense to try to remove something based on its index because things in a set aren't ordered. One weird thing you might notice is that maps don't actually extend the collection interface. But maybe that's just because maps don't really have a lot in common with lists and sets. That's just sort of a design decision that the people who were developing the Java language made. For better or for worse, this is the interface hierarchy. You might also notice that the collection interface extends iterable. And iterable just requires that any class that implements it has to have an iterator method. And that just allows us to traverse any collection using an enhanced for loop. That's the crucial thing that allows us to use that control structure. So these are the interfaces. I, I recognize we haven't spent a lot of time talking about each of these particular types of data structures, yet, but we'll spend some time in the future. Now for the classes that implement those interfaces. Here you can see the four classes that implement the list interface, which are linked lists, array lists, vectors, and stacks. Again, I know we haven't talked much in detail about what those are, but we'll get to it. And the one class that implements the queue interface, which is just linked lists. You can see that if you have a program that requires something list-like, you actually have a bunch of different options to choose from. And you'd make that choice based on the specific thing you're trying to do, the runtime considerations, and sort of what made the most sense to use. Once we talk about the actual data structures themselves, those choices will become a little bit more apparent. There are a bit fewer options for sets and maps. You can see, in fact, there's only one class that implements each of those interfaces. Uh, that's in contrast, again, to lists and stacks where there are four. So again, pause the video for a second and take a look through these real quick. Don't worry if you don't know what these data structures are. We will talk about them as the unit progresses. That's it for today. Next time, we'll talk more specifically about lists as our first key data structure.